I want to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs and the University of Iowa's Honors Program, and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. And I thank today's special financial sponsors, John Menninger and Mace and Kay Braverman. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Squire, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Janet. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Hans Haus. Um, he's Professor and Vice Chair of Education in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Iowa. He's really our go-to person for infectious disease. Um, Dr. House received his undergraduate degree in marine biology. He's a, really a Renaissance man from the University of Southern California, and then his MD in 1997, and subsequently a diploma of tropical medicine from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and a master's in academic medicine from the Keck School of Medicine at USC. Um, he holds board certification in internal medicine and emergency medicine. So it's great pleasure to welcome Dr. House as he speaks to us today on avian flu H7N9 and the risks of the next great pandemic. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much for inviting me back here. I really enjoy uh, coming and, and speaking to this group. So it was a thrill for me to, to see that email uh, invite me back. And I hope I hope I do well enough today to, to get invited back yet again. I'm going to do two things today. Two things today for you. I'm going to confuse you, and I'm going to scare you a little bit. I'm going to confuse you because I'm going to be talking a lot about subtypes of influenza. There's going to be a lot of H something N somethings today. A lot of H somethings N somethings. And for people like me who are really into this stuff, that really means something. I really care which of the N numbers there are or H numbers. But you probably don't. <laughs> and you will probably stumble over it and you probably get very confused. It's OK. So from here on out, as I rattle off these different H numbers and N numbers, if you just think in your head, all right, different subtypes of flu. OK, so flu comes in lots of different forms, different species. This is like a subtype of the flu. So I'm talking about different subtypes of flu. So I say H7N9, you just think different subtype of flu, and you're, you're good. And we'll be on the same page. We'll be, we're happy. And I'm going to scare you a little bit. This is kind of a boring topic. I mean, if we just like stick to the H's and N's numbers and stuff, and then there's a lot of you know subtypes and everything, and who really cares? So I'm going to try to put it into some context and try to make you care. And to do that, I got to scare you a little bit. Let's start with a little lesson from history. I want to tell you a story. Now I've told the story before, and I'm going to tell it again. The year is 1346. We're in Kaffa, in, in the Crimea. Crimea. And um, this is a Genoese trading post. And it's under siege by the Tartan army. And at this time, the Tartan army from Asia, this, this mysterious disease gets, starts among, among the, the, the soldiers there. And some of the soldiers die. And the Tartans take the diseased bodies, and they lob them into the city. Well, somehow the Genoese manage to escape. They make their way back to Italy, but they first stop in Sicily. And when they do, rats that are on their ship run onto the ground, take up residence in the thatch huts, and for the next four years, the Black Plague rages across Europe, wipes out 50% of the population. You had a new disease being introduced into a susceptible population by a vector that lived in conjunction with humans. 1918, in Kansas, in army barracks, respiratory illness starts among soldiers. Now, that's nothing unusual. It happens all the time. If you get enough 
people together in a closed environment, you're going to get respiratory problems. But what was weird about this one was people were dying from it. The attack rate was ridiculously higher than we'd ever seen before. And it spread throughout the entire world. Then that fall in November, World War I ends. And millions of, of soldiers demobilize and come home to their various countries. And all of a sudden, you have the second wave of influenza. Eventually, the Spanish flu infects one third of the population of the world. Kills as many as 50 million people. Novel virus, movement of people, susceptible population. 1976, we're in the Ebola River in northern Congo, southern Sudan. And a stranger shows up out of the jungle with this mysterious illness I've never seen before. High fever, a lot of vomiting, a lot of diarrhea, a lot of bleeding. He dies. And then everybody else at that health center, at that clinic, also gets the disease, and most of them die. Now, this disease was so virulent, so dramatic, that it wiped itself out within a few weeks. And for the next few years, every now and then, there was a little sporadic case of it here and there throughout the jungle of Central Africa. And then, in 2014, it started in West Africa in a place where people could easily move. And, and there were roads, and there was commerce. And eventually, 11,300 people died of Ebola. Nava virus introduced in susceptible population. And finally, you have the movement that creates for the exchange of that, of that disease. And finally, 1981, at UCLA, where I trained for residency, an infectious disease specialist named Dr. Gottlieb was consulted about some strange cases of opportunistic infection. Opportunistic infections are infections that they come up only in people who, that have a poor immune system, like at that time, only seen in transplant patients. And he measured their, their patient's immune cells, and they found the patient had zero. They had none. And so he wrote up a case report and submitted to the CDC. And the CDC published it in their weekly report. And the title was, was called uh, Opportunistic Infections in Homosexual Males in Los Angeles. That was the first written report of AIDS. And we know, of course, what happened after that. So how do new diseases start? Where do new diseases come from? Evolution is a process that takes millions of years. And little defects in genetics and selected advantages are selected for. And over time, species change. Well, yeah, that's true, except in the case of microbiology, where it can happen in a petri dish overnight. Because so many diseases are carried by vectors, vectors like mosquitoes, vectors like the, the flea that's on that rat in Sicily, that the climate, the ecosystems, are really important for disease transmission. And if you have changing climate, you're going to have dis changes of disease transmission, disease changes of vector patterns. What humans do. What humans do, where they live, makes a big difference. If you crowd together in, in one place, an urban place, um, you're going to be more likely to transmit disease. You're more likely exposed to other people. If you push out into jungles where you have been before, you're going to encounter new diseases that hadn't been, been there before. And most importantly is international travel. You can get from one place in the world to any other place in the world within 24 hours. And those diseases can, too. So let's talk about influenza specifically. And this is whole, that old H and N thing I, talk, I refer to. We classify influenza A based on the surface glycoproteins. Those are the proteins on the surface of the virus. And they're a little bit different. And there's two types of, 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 of glycoproteins that we look at. We look at the H subtype, which is hemagglutinin. And that's a protein that attaches the virus to the respiratory tract. Now, if, if it attaches in the lower respiratory tract in the lungs, OK, that's bad, right? That's going to cause pneumonia. People have trouble breathing. But it's going to be really hard to catch, because you, 
you've got a long distance for that virus to travel up to the mouth to get out, to cough. But if it attaches to the nose or the pharynx, it's right up at the front. You can, get, you can transmit that virus as easily as having a common cold. Neuramidase, the N, that just refers to a, a, a protein that the virus uses to, to make more of itself, to cleave off its little portions. Every year, influenza A will change its glycoproteins. It's going to change its format. It evolves. Evolution takes place in the petri dish overnight. It evolves all the time. And those proteins are always changing. And this is called antigenic drift, meaning there's a slow drift in what the, what the influenza looks like. Our immune cells know what influenza looks like, the influenza we've had before. But within a year, within two years, within four years, it's going to look totally different. And the immune system has to learn it again. And that's why you get a flu shot every year. Because every year, we have a different set of strains that are out there, and we need to adjust the, in, the influenza, influenza vaccine for what we have available. Now, what's really interesting about influenza is that although there's lots of different types, there's really only about three types of the H's that really are established in humans. They can attach to our respiratory tract, they can attach to our nose, and that we can give to each other very easily. This is the seasonal influenza that we all know and love or not so love. <laughs> Turns out there's lots of other types of influenza. And birds get all of them. And pigs can get them too. And every now and then, somewhere in the world, the wrong pig meets up with the wrong bird and you get antigenic shift. Now you get dramatic change. Not just the little tiny change that happens every year for influenza, but a big dramatic change in what the influenza looked like. And that leads to pandemics. 1957, 1968, and probably a lot of you remember 2009. So this graphic, I think, I think explains it well. There's lots of subtypes. Lots of H's and N's. And they all are in the birds. And there's a few that are in pigs. And there's a few that are in humans. And there's overlap between those two. There's overlap between those two. So someone that a bird gets, uh, that pig can get. And then there's ones that the human can get, and that pig can get. And it mixes in that pig. And then all of a sudden, we have a new disease. Who saw the movie Contagion? Fantastic movie. Actually, almost everything in that is totally real, which just makes it so scary, which I love it. It was really good. And one of the things they say in this, in this movie is they talk about how somewhere in the world, the wrong bat met up with the wrong pig. And that remix, that, that, that exchange of genetic material leads to this massive pandemic. What he says at the very end is, I don't want anyone working on this except the BSL-4. Does anybody know what that means? It's bio, yeah, it's bio safety level four. That refers to the amount of containment that you use to control those viruses. Now, bio safety level, there's different levels, one, two, and three. We have a level three lab here at the, at, at the university. And the, the most dangerous things you know, are usually treated in there. But for the really bad stuff, like Ebola, like this avian flu, that gets treated only in BSL-4. And there's only a few of those labs, including the CDC and a few others. So let's get back to influenza. So I talked about, at the beginning, some stories from like the Crimea, and from Kansas, and Ebola River. Someday, a generation from now, Someone like me is going to be standing up here in front of me and tell, giving a talk just like this, and they're going to tell a story about the great history of the pandemics. And one of the cities that they're going to include in that story is going to be Hong Kong in 1997. Now, what happened in Hong Kong in 1997? That was the first outbreak of H5N1. Oh, there we go, another H and N's thing. Okay, this is the bad one. So 
there's this avian flu, everyone knows about avian flu, okay, the birds get sick sometimes, and all of a sudden, birds get sick didn't affect humans, but all of a sudden, in 1997 in Hong Kong, it did. And there were 18 cases of people that worked with poultry, worked with chickens, and they got sick, and six of them died. That's a 30% mortality rate. Holy moly, that's really bad. And everybody noticed in a relatively short period of time. And said, this is a new virus. This is bad. This is going to spread out throughout the world. We need to wipe it out right now. And they killed all the chickens in Hong Kong. That's a lot of chickens. <laughs> and then it went away. And everything was fine. <sighs> we did it. Yeah, not so much. So in 2003, it showed up, and it hasn't gone away since. We have a vaccine for it now, so it's relatively under control. There's been about 859 cases so far, um, and it's about a 50% mortality. That's less than 1,000 cases. That's not a lot, but significant. Where in the world does this exist? As you can see in this, in this slide, it's kind of all over. Today, the most cases that we see are in Vietnam, Indonesia, and Egypt. Which one of these three is not like the other? That's random. So this disease that started in chickens in Hong Kong and is really prevalent in Vietnam and Indonesia is also big in Egypt. Why? Because of the birds. Now, yes, there's some poultry trade and they probably some Silk Road trucks that maybe brought some infected chickens up to Egypt, that's fine. But it's in a migratory pathway where these birds are flying over. Now, when, when birds get the flu, they don't just get like a little cough and like, you know, their feathers get ruffled and they want to stay in bed and they, you know, they look really miserable. <laughs> birds get a gastroenteritis. They get diarrhea. And every one of those little virus particles, or poop has thousands of virus particles. And they're basically spreading this flu everywhere they fly in this migratory pathway. So it might start on a poultry farm, but then it gets transmitted to uh, maybe a Canadian goose that lives nearby. And then that then migrates and everywhere it flies over. And this is exactly what happened in, in Iowa, during the, 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 we had some bird flu that wiped out a bunch of our turkeys a few years ago. Same kind of thing. Someone doesn't have to weaponize the bird flu. The birds are doing that. They're spreading the virus just in their normal habitat um, and their migratory pathways. And when they get sick, that's what they, they, they spread out. And you can transmit it from, from a domestic flock to a wild bird, flies to a distance to another domestic flock. So some researchers in, in Wisconsin and in, uh, in Holland were working on this H5N1 stuff, and they were mutating it on purpose um, and infecting uh, um, badgers or something like that, some sort of, some sort of rodent animal, and uh, because it was an animal model for, for a respiratory tract um, attachment for humans. And they managed to make an H5N1 virus that was really easily transmittable. That had walked out in the floor, had walked out in someone's shoe out of the lab, it would have been really bad. It's kind of a dumb thing to do, right? But, but the point of this, the point of this experiment was, was to see how many you know, mutations it would take for this to become a problem. And, and their estimate was it, was it was five mutations. Now, five mutations doesn't sound like a lot, but, but you know, it, it, that, that's a lot of evolution that has to happen. Of course, as we talked about, evolution happens in a petri dish overnight. So that's where we were with H5N1. We now have a virus for it. We now have a vaccine for it. It's relatively controlled. The number of cases that occur, the new cases that occur every year, are very, is very small. It's not much of a problem. It was definitely scary. The world prepared for it. Not much seemed to happen. Sixteen years later. We have another new virus, H7N9. Now, whereas H5N1 started in Hong Kong, H7N9 started in Shanghai. All right, quick geography quiz. Which one of these two is Hong Kong? A or B? 
B is correct. Very good. A is Shanghai. All right. You guys know your Chinese cities. I'm impressed. Okay. Um, so it started in Shanghai in, in February 2013, and it ha it's following these like very periodic waves. Winter, winter, spring. Um, you get you, you get a few dozen cases, maybe a few hundred cases, mostly in eastern China. And what's interesting is it's mostly in cities. So we talk about bird flu being in poultry farms, being in, in the farms, being where in poultry workers, people that are around a lot of chickens. And that's true. But this was occurring in people that were living in cities that were not raising chickens, people that were buying chickens. Because typically chickens are sold live, and then they're they're then they're they're, um, they're killed they're killed they're they're killed in the home for unprepared. So a graphic uh, demonstration of this H seven and nine. The reason that I'm here, the reason that I was asked to speak, was the last outbreak, the one that just happened this last winter, was huge. It was much bigger than all the other ones. So this disease, which is a curiosity, which is that. I knew about because I'm like, oh, wow, it's another HN thing that I need to know about, and I'm paying attention. Now, all of a sudden, this last outbreak, and this is another, another view of the same thing showing the number of deaths, all of a sudden, this outbreak is a lot bigger. And everybody noticed. So what's going to happen in 2018? So what does this stuff do? Well, first of all, there's been about 1,200 cases. Now think about that. Let's compare it to the last strain I talked about, the H5N1. That was the really bad strain, the one that was, this, that was all scary. That was about 900 cases ever we've ever had. So just in the last four years, five years, we've had 1,200 cases of this stuff. So it's going at a little faster rate. 40% mortality. That's really bad. That's really dangerous. Uh, usually in older males, uh, around ages 58 or so, um, and everybody reports some sort of exposure to poultry or preparing poultry. So why don't you get it in more in the cities? Why don't you, why aren't you getting even more? Why there are there more cases? Why are you transmitting it between people? And that's been the big question. So yeah, it's dangerous. Yeah, if you, if you work with chickens or you prepare chickens, you might get sick. But even if a family member gets sick, you generally are not going to catch it. And this leads to what are the factors that are associated with the ability to spread? And why do new strains keep showing up in China? That's one of the most common questions I get. Why do these things always start in China? You have a lot of people and a lot of chickens and a lot of pigs. And the numbers are just that much. And that random chance, that random evolution, the evolution that happens in a petri dish overnight. If you, the more times, the more exposures, the more replications of the virus you get, the more likely you're going to get a mutation that's going to be a problem. They interviewed one of the researchers um, and about this big spike in 20, 2017, and he said that 10 years ago, this was not that big a deal. We knew about this virus. We knew about this virus for a long time. But now it's deadlier. Now it kills our chickens within 24 hours in a lab. So why isn't killing people like that? Because you can't transmit it. Remember I talked about the H, the hemagglutinin? Remember I talked about the different parts of the respiratory tract it could be in? It might be in the lungs, right? If, if, if it attaches into the, in the lungs, in the lower part, that's a long way that, that virus has got to get out for it to, to, to to infect somebody else. You're going to have to go up and cough in somebody's face a lot before you're going to get exposed. But if it were to mutate and it could sit in the nose, that's where it allows it to be transmitted very easily. As you might imagine, this has caused a considerable amount of anxiety. This is a cartoon. He's reading a paper about avian flu, and, and the bird says, hey, you want to see him freak? Let's cough. <laughs> <laughs> or sneeze. Or... So the CDC tracks this stuff, and they keep track of these different viruses and these different strains, and they say, which are the ones that we need to worry about? H5N1, we don't need to worry about that much. There's a lot of characteristics about that strain that's not that big a deal. H7N9, we need to worry. 
Why? Some of the things the CDC looks at for estimating pandemic potential, I'll talk about more and more what that means in a minute, pandemic potential is the properties of the virus itself, right? Where do those receptors bind? Is it in the nose? It is in the lungs, right? Is it transmitted in lab animals? Do those chickens in the lab get, get sick very easily? And does it respond to antiviral treatment? That's like a big thing. So that was like one of the big things, and I'll talk about in a minute, a, a new strain, which is that basically it, didn't, it was kind of resistant to one of the antiviral medicines that we had. Um, and has the, have people seen it before? Is this one that we know about in humans, we know about for a long time, and therefore humans are sort of already have a, some degree of immunity to it? Or is this something that's brand new? And if it's something brand new, you're more likely to get sick from it. And where is it? Where is it distributed? Is it some, is it some fruit bat in the middle of Central Africa where you're never gonna, where you're never gonna experience it, like Ebola? Or is it in a domestic pig in Iowa where we're gonna see it every single day? So when I said talk about the pandemic potential, we're talking about the, the ability for something to spread around the world in a pandemic or pan epidemic. And the World Health Organization classifies epidemics into different um, phases, different categories. First, and you look at these the different definitions, but first it's like, it's just in the wild and that's it. Or it's just like Ebola, and it's just in the wild and occasionally we get this kind of bad outbreak in when people encounter it in the jungle. Or it's like seasonal flu. It happens. We transmit to it, but it's not that big a deal. We don't spread it that far. People get over the disease fairly quickly. Or is it more like it starts in one place and then it spreads to another community and then to another community? And once it exceeds two regions of the world, so North America and Europe, or North America and Africa, or Asia and South America. Once you have it in two regions of the world, that meets the definition of a pandemic. Let me show you what a pandemic looks like. So for me, for somebody who studies this kind of stuff, what happened in 2009 was thrilling. I was so excited. I was geeking out with my emails every day from the World Health Organization. I loved it. It was so sick and wrong, but it's okay. Um, you know, I recognize I've got a, some strange thoughts, but that's okay. For me, it was really interesting to be able to see a pandemic develop real time right in front of me uh, as it was going along was really exciting. And we talk about how all these new strains show up in China. Well, this one didn't. This one started on a pig farm in Veracruz in Mexico. Somewhere in the world, the wrong pig met up with the wrong bird. And this time, it happened to be in Veracruz, Mexico. And very soon after that, spread to California. Now, we're all still around today because it turns out H1N1, although it was spread around the world very quickly, it wasn't that virulent. And we had a lot of preparations in place, like stockpiling antiviral medications, like having uh, a vaccine mechanism. We were actually prepared for H5N1. We were getting ready for that when this thing happened. And we put all the, the, the preparations for H5N1 into place for this form, which is H1N1. I promised you a lot of different H's and N's. I'm serious. Um, so we put all those, those preparations into place for this virus, and we're able to you know, relatively control the impact in terms of mortality. But it didn't contain the spread of the virus. So this is an animation showing the virus spreading around the world, starting in Mexico, then affecting the United States, then Asia, then China, then South Asia, then South America. And as we get into fall, then it gets to Europe, and then it gets impressive. And that's what a pandemic looks like. OK, so I've managed to scare you. What are we going to do about it? Surveillance, just like we talked about here. We need to know these new strains are out there. When I talk to my physician colleagues, I tell them, this is why we need to test people for, for flu. It actually doesn't help the person that we're taking care of that, at, that, at that time. If I have someone who comes to my ER, and they have symptoms of the flu, 
and they have all the signs of flu, and I know they have a flu, and you, you know they have a flu, I know they have a flu, they know they have a flu, everyone knows they got a flu. If I do a test for a flu, that doesn't help me at all because it takes two days to get back anyway. So why the heck would I do it? I'm doing it because I am participating in surveillance. I'm getting an idea of what strains are out there. We need to know what do we put in our vaccine every year. What, what forms of, of, of flu strain should we put in our vaccine? Obviously, livestock exposure is a big factor here, right? So if our, if our pigs are, uh, and our chickens are in areas where they're open to the root, or open to the environment, they're going to get more likely to be exposed to those migratory birds. Okay, that's going to lead to you know, transmission of virus. Vaccine development is really important. I talked about the H1N1. We had a, can a candidate vaccine for that virus six days after it first appeared because everything was in place ready for H5N1 and we just put all those, those mechanisms in, in, into action for that, for that virus instead. So vaccine development is one. H5N1 is not a big deal anymore today because we have a good vaccine for it. So obviously a vaccine for H7N9 would be nice. Education, what we're doing today. Everyone needs to know about this. Everyone needs to wash their hands, especially during flu season, and cough into your elbow, sneeze in your elbow. There's a reason we do that. So all those viruses that are sitting on that, on that hemagglutin receptors in our nose aren't spread to somebody else. New diseases are always going to start. And as long as there are la there's a lack of fresh water and there's, and there's, there's poverty in the world, we will always see new diseases. So we will always see new diseases. How effective are antiviral meds is our first question. That's a great question. It's actually a relatively controversial one in that the belief is that the, um, the most common antiviral medication, oseltamivir or Tamiflu, is probably less effective than people were led to believe and, people, and uh, certainly the marketing lead people, leads people to believe. And reanalysis of, of previous literature uh, now in, in, in emergency medicine, um, we believe it basically doesn't do much for, for individual patients. However, given that there are a lack of other options, I think for the highest risk patient for someone who's actually ill, I still recommend uh, treating it. It's just for the average person who's otherwise healthy who would get through the flu just fine, it's probably not, not worth giving. One, should flu surveillance be done by clinics attached to the CDC or similar, um, or should it be done by or not done by random local physicians? That's a great, great question. Actually, the, the, the surveillance system is, is pretty effective because we have um, a reporting system that goes up the chain. So our own hospital here collects those virus samples, identifies the strains. The, rate, the state reference lab is right here in Oakdale. Um, so that's, that's what we get the, we make the final decisions about what kind of strains are out there. That's reported to local health departments. Local health departments then report to the state health department, state health departments then report to the CDC. And moving up that chain, that's how we know. So that's actually how the different viruses, uh, different strains get reported to the CDC. We know that every year. What we need is we need for all the other countries to do that as well. What diseases or illnesses might, be, might the storm victims in Texas be exposed to? Great questions. Based on our experience from Katrina, um, one of the biggest problems we see is in, in the immediate phase afterwards is when people are trying to deal with um, cuts, lacerations, injuries, that kind of thing, and they have a lot of this water around them, they get a particular type of bacteria from the, from the water that gets into, the, into those, those injuries. We see that in construction workers, so that's going to be the next phase. As people come in and they do the d destruction on the ruins houses, try to strip out the, the drywall, that kind of thing, those construction workers are going to um, uh, get exposed to that, um, to that, to that water and to, that, and to those, to those cuts and that kind of thing, and, that's, and they and need to be particular, uh, treated with a particular type of antibiotic, not the ones, it's not, doesn't respond to our usual skin anti-infective bacteria medication, it has to be a very specific one. So um, physicians in the area need to know that. Um, and that's kind of the one, one of the unique things. Other than that, it's, it's really it's, it's, it's any problem that you would have with not having fresh water. So, um, it, and this is, relates to you know, uh, clean drinking water, 
um, are you going to get uh, uh, foodborne illnesses, diarrheal illnesses, um, you're going to have a hard time uh, preparing food and hand washing. And, um, and as all those kind of issues, hygiene issues, I think are a big issue um, over the next few weeks and months. What is the risk of spreading viruses or other infectious diseases through consumption of meat, dairy, eggs, et cetera? Um, it's, 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 not, it's not that high. Um, so I talked about you know, people in China getting H7 and 9 from, from chickens, from, from poultry. They get it mostly from the preparation of the chicken, which means is they take the chicken, killing the chicken, stripping the, 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 the feathers off the chicken, and then butchering it. That process exposes the person to a lot of blood, a lot of, of body fluids of the chicken. That's where you're gonna get sick. If you take a, a processed piece of meat and you cook it thoroughly, the risk is, is, is minimal, almost zero. So, th so that, it's really from the preparation of the, of the animal product that, that, that where the risk is, is incurred. I'm going to put both of them out here. What do the H's and the N's stand for, for <laughs> one thing? And then how long would it have taken to prepare for the uh, H1N1 outbreak had there not already been precautions taken for the H5N1? So again, he, H is hemagglutinin. That's the one that attaches the respiratory tract. N is neuramidase. That's the one that cleaves the virus into different parts to make the, the new virus particles as, as it spreads out. Um, and that's just the and those proteins are present on the surface of the virus, so we can identify them easily. We can classify the the, the virus easily. Um, I think H one N one would have been significantly more more of a problem had we not already prepared for H five N one. We would have probably seen the same number of cases. There was nothing that we could do about the spread of that thing. That thing spread super fast, as you saw in a matter of months, and really all over the world. But in terms of the virulence um, and the containment, um, I think that people would not have, have recognized it sooner, and more people would potentially would have been exposed within communities, and people that were susceptible would have been exposed, and most importantly, we would not we would have had been much longer to get a vaccine. We had a vaccine; um, it, it showed up in April, and we had a vaccine in healthcare workers um, that fall. So that's that's really fast, and I think that 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 vaccine would never have happened if we hadn't had the preparations already. Uh, I think our last question is, how did you get interested in this field? <laughs> I, um, in medical school, um, I, I remember distinctly, I, I was in my first couple days of, of microbiology, first time I'd ever taken it was in second year of medical school, and I started reading um, my textbook, and just, it was a light went on, and I was just like, this is what I want to do. This is amazing. And I was absolutely fascinated with it. And I read that textbook like, like pleasure reading material. I would study microbiology even though I didn't need to, just so I could procrastinate and not have to study something else that, 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 I, that was boring, that I hated. Um, it, was, it stems a little bit from my background as, as a marine biologist, because in marine biology, we, we focus a lot on taxonomy and the classification of, of animals and the ecology, where they fit in. And it's that ecologic niche, the idea that animals have, and plants, have their own niche, have somewhere they fit into the ecology of the world. And the idea that parasites, or bacteria, or even viruses, have an ecologic niche that fits into humanity and then causes disease, to, to me, is absolutely fascinating. And um, the more bizarre and the more, the more scary the, the virus or the, the, the infection is, the happier I get. Weird. Thank you. Well, we now conclude our program, and I want to give a great big thank you to Dr. House for his presentation. So, and I want to thank our sponsors as well, the University of Iowa International Program and the University of Iowa's Honors Program and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we also thank today's special financer, 
financial sponsors, Mason K. Braverman and John Menninger. And we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available to viewing audiences. Uh, Dr. House, as a small token of our appreciation, we will give you yet again another very coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. And I'm looking forward to being able to give you another highly coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug in the future when you come speak to us again. So thank you very much.